see you, Hugh Lloyd. You Lloyd. You Lloyd, yeah. Nice to see yeah. you too. Welcome yeah. back. Thank you. From across the pond, and uh, here we go again. Now I have I have read a little bit more of your uh, theoretical and conceptual work, and I have to say, it's very interesting, and it's also largely over my head. So, but I think today is going to bring me a lot closer to understanding some of the main concepts. For example, um, there are parts that I already kind of knew about and that I had a grounding in. So, and then when I, when I encountered those parts in the particular manner that they were written, I'm like, oh, okay, now, now I see how this writing style goes. Mm -hmm. So I'm hoping that the, uh, the uh, conversation today can clarify a few things. Now, these are complex complex topics are you uh are you a theorist oh um theory plays a strong part in my my work for sure um but this is i mean the 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 issues you just raised about not necessarily grasping everything is is one of the reasons why i was pointing to this paper or this work really it's you could say it's more than just a paper because it, it's a synthesis of a, of a large amount of things and it could easily be two or three times the length of, mm. of what I put in it. Um, but I was pointing to this particularly because it, I, it, I thought it, it could help because it's, you have to be careful up front here saying that although there's many ideas that come into this, this paper and it's very, I would say it's very strongly uh, influenced by um, Vygotsky and thought and a lot of his colleagues. Um, you could have, um, critics of this paper who might have different views of Vygotsky could come back and say well it's it's not actually Vygotsky and I say yeah but that that's fine okay but what it can show is I think uh that kind of thinking in a given time to actually cohere and show all the different aspects of it and also give um entry points that might be easy that might help you to think about these and um, that's one of the reasons why I was drawing attention to this this paper. Mm. I'm just going to expand this window here a bit to make it sure. a bit bigger for me. Let me so I can see a bit better. There. Oh, that's better. Okay. Yeah. So, so, so your answer to my question: Are you a theorist? Oh, is, well, or somewhat is. Um, would you well, say no, yes? Yes. Yes. It's temperamentally. Okay. You know, uh, quite um, quite uh, deep on the thinking side um and that's probably reflective in the in the, the papers that i'm writing um or, or have written how is um, that how is that different from say just maybe being like an academic or even just being a uh oh a thinking person yeah that's what i mean just a thinking yeah. person really that's all i mean by theorist i don't mean that well um it does make some differences i mean that because i've i've been in in and out of universities and you know i've Initially, I've made attempts to, you know, to, to, because uh, a lot of this was written, this was written quite recently, like two, it was, I finally wrote it a year or so, about a year or so ago, but it, but it began several years before then. And it was just, you know, so all the dates on there, I say the date on here is March 2020. Mm -hmm. But there's a lot that went into here that come from about five years before then. And I started the software project. I started at least mm. that sort of time as well for years. And it, it sort of got put on hold and then resumed and other things. So the dates can be a bit um, uh, ambiguous or, yeah. you know, because, and sometimes you might just put a date on something because that was the last time you edited it, you know, and, and, and there's content that comes from before. So right. when I, so when we're talking about theorists, it's like saying, yeah, I, I want to, um, want to understand things really that that's all that it comes down to i would say um and perhaps offer offer an explanation for things as well yeah yeah absolutely um and then maybe that, test and then maybe test that explanation out yeah but people sometimes you mean there's sort of if you're going to come up with dichotomies or different categories of things and you say oh this person's sort of action oriented this person's mm -hmm. thinking but i would say well no um you try to develop all all these 
faculties you know i mean i used to play lots of sports mm -hmm. and you know you just engage in, in many different things um but i would say certainly the the thinking side and the theoretical side are strong or stronger aspects perhaps to to my contribution although it can create difficulties as well because especially in in the mode of uh, the social sciences and the way people like to do things often people will say well they want uh, uh, the empirical components first and then you can build up your theory upon this and other things but I'd say this is much more about temperament than anything else and you can you can start the other way but that's one of the things I, 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 I endeavoured to do with this work as well is that there are there's the theoretical parts there's the, there's the synthesis uh, and then there's a, a very methodical planned experimental study and and real nitty-gritty sort of um, detailed experimental work in it as well that if you, ha if you had your if you had your say would you would you want to see more experimental studies based off of your work by you or by others personally i mean I, in terms of bang for buck I, I just i just get much more from the theory because mm -hmm. i think once you have a certain degree of confidence and understanding where you are once you've really it, it's not just wishy-washy theory it's not it's not because people can use even with the word theory people can use in different ways right some people would just say uh, a bunch of ideas is a theory but somebody who's really been uh systematic in what they're doing they say no uh, a theory needs to be something that that has potential that holds together as, and has got rigor to it and has actually been tested to a certain degree mm. and there's quite a big difference between you know that's the way we can use that's where we just use words in our language you talk about things but they have very different um connotations and meanings in that respect so just a, a bunch of ideas isn't necessarily theory in a um, in a practical sense it's it be much more loose but then once you're starting to get into how things fit together then you're starting to get a bit perhaps a bit more more theoretical but th this has a sliding scale that you can relate to what's in my paper too hopefully mm. if you start to get into what's in my paper you know lots of little light bulbs will start flashing and you'll start to be able to relate to a lot more and um, but you just have to bear in mind that you can't you can't just transpose what i'm saying directly onto vygotsky you you mm -hmm. certainly there is I, I i i i show the alignment and I do look at tables and all the rest in this paper saying, this is what this psychologist says, this is what the other one says, and I, they come together in these sorts of ways. Uh, um, so all of that is there. Yes. Um, so, but it, it yeah, it, it, hopefully, it's, hopefully it's a sort of, you know, meaty paper, you know, that can take a while to get through rather than, uh, you know. Yeah, so, and, and, uh, and it's going to be a couple of readings for me, along with note taking. I, I pulled a bunch of quotes out, and I, you know, I, I wrote down a lot of thoughts. And I, yeah. it's definitely a piece that I could spend a lot of mm. time with alone, and and with you. And and I hope to spend a lot of time with it today. But I, right. I, I also wanted to ask you. Um, I think this is actually from section twenty one of your paper. We talked about this briefly last time. Mm -hmm. When 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 Davidoff comes up with the method for teaching quantity via measurement where the students in the class had to essentially event, invent like a, a measurement technique mm -hmm. because yeah. they went from measuring tangible things in front of them to immovable objects around the room. Mm -hmm. They had to basically like to compare the windowsill to the door. Okay. Yeah. The window yeah. to the door. They had to sort mm -hmm. of invent a system of measurement. Um, now you as a, as a, as an adult and an advanced thinker did you is is active orientation an invention that solved the problem for you is this something that you had to discover or invent um yes S similar, although, although... You know, similar to the similar to the way the kids had to invent yes measurements though. yes pretty much i mean it's it, uh i mean davidov has his own version of that an implicit version i mean he's using uh vygotsky in thought and ideas from leontiev and others and all, all the psychologists that, and educators that he, he collaborated with have this understanding 
but yes act i mean i i've been coming back to this because people have been asking me a little bit about active orientation what i mean by it and also the questioning perhaps people i've you know, reading around criticisms of leontive and there's like recently the discussion we were having on the uh, cultural practice forum um and um uh one of the professors i can't remember his surname Ar aru if i've pronounced his first christian name right uh, yeah, sorry if I've, yeah Sumala. He, Sumala. he 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 made some um forceful points and some of them you know quite quite interesting and when i compare the juxtapose that to some other um papers that i've read criticism criticizing leontive um there's a point of view that they share um, that's suggesting that uh, Leontive didn't get the whole picture and that he was only, he, he kind of just saw one side of the equation to a certain degree and he didn't, didn't necessarily take into account a, a twofold process that is necessary and that goes on within dialectical process of, of um, mental development. Um, now, in my when I was studying and reading uh, Leontive, I wasn't trying to distinguish him from Vygotsky necessarily. And when I when I do these readings, it's usually to to um, develop my own understandings. So the focus is on the coherence of ideas, and if there's something that crops up that could be read either way, right? And I'll give an example in a sec. If there's something that crops up right there either way. The pro chances are I'm going to try and give it the benefit of the doubt and bring it into this cohere coherent system. So um, uh, there's another academic who I, I like his writing, that's um, Alexander Simava. I think I've, I'm sorry if I've mispronounced that, I've got it slightly wrong. And he he talks about, he, he his focus is on some of the, the wording that Leontive uses that reflects a sort of um, a, an incomplete grasp of the of the nature of the problem of understanding this this developmental process and he talks about for example how leontive uses words like how the environment influences the person or the stimuli from the environment and so this is always a fallback into the old way of thinking about things okay now, there's lots of argument you can put into this, but we'll say when I was reading this, I would just naturally just give Leontive the benefit of the doubt and think that rather than Leontive using a very roundabout way of describing things as saying um, the, the, learn, the learner's construal of the environment and its effect upon his uh, understanding, he might just say the environment had this had this influence okay so one's a bit more direct but you lose the the you lose the exactness or the more precision of it and there's lots of cases of that for, for for leontive but when i was when i was studying leontive i just i just because leontive had been very categorical and very um um consistent in other areas like for example he was saying perception isn't something that directly comes to the environment perception is mediated by a person's own understanding yeah so people will perceive differently depending upon their own uh, uh, own um, process um i just naturally took that over and said well okay the, the leontive has has these principles that in using in knowing these principles then naturally he's going to apply them to everything else he isn't going to just say oh hang on other mental processes have something, you know, work in a very different fashion. So I was just giving it the benefit of the doubt. Now, um, so this this comes back to my work, and you could say that if if you're saying that if people are arguing that Leontive only had this single did you know was a sort of single sided view, and he missed out aspects of development, um, then okay, say so fine. But what that means really, from the perspective of my my work is you could say that if that's your standpoint then you and you look upon what i've been doing with respect to active orientation as coming or as producing a slightly different version of activity theory in which both processes 
are taken into account, that it's not just a one directional process that's been considered. And so you could impute, um, a, you know, a degree of creativity or more of a degree of creativity in my work and saying active orientation is effectively a variant of activity theory that explains the object of activity in a different way. Okay. And that other, and it brings in other aspects to it. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, um, uh, there's, there's, uh, I can't remember exactly your question when you started with, but I know, I think I'm addressing. A fair yeah, bit my, my, my question was to, to what extent did you have to sort of invent a concept or, or a right. theory okay. yeah, exactly. to solve, you know, to solve a problem that you. Exactly. So that's what, I, that's what active orientation mm -hmm. comes, comes down to. I mean, the, the and is, 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 was part of that, excuse me, sorry, was part of that problem uh, like a lack of specificity or a certain degree of ambiguity in the text well, the, you were reading? The, the, problem, the problem started with me way, way before I came to, um, came to know about Vygotsky and Leontief. Mm -hmm. I mean, we've had, I think we touched on this before, is saying that my, my original problems stemmed back from uh, the late 1990s when I was uh, studying cognitive science and just the the fact that it just didn't fit together for me very well but the, one of the issues here of course is that so if you understand why something doesn't fit together then you already understand to a large degree what it is that needs to be added you only it's only when you start to find out the solution that you start you get a better understanding of what the problem was that you were intuiting in the first place. Yeah. So until yeah. you've got the key, you can't really go back and say, this is what you're doing wrong. Yeah. yeah Do you see? Yeah, yeah. yeah. You could name it in a different way too. Yeah. yeah. Um, I have a straightforward question, but maybe it's not. Um, what, what role does active orientation play in cognitive development or cognitive reorganization? Like what role does it play? Um, what roles? You could say it is, it, it represents the, um, the scope, the window, or the um, cohering, coordinating aspect of one's undertaking. Now, um, this is only correct in the sense that if you want to go around and sort of label things like in a, if you're looking at, um, Oh, anatomy, for example, when you say, well, you have an elbow and an arm and these other things, right? An elbow isn't, you know, when you're looking at the body, it's only, it's only useful to call an elbow an elbow if you, you know, if, for example, you're interested in that joint or something, all right? Everything, an elbow doesn't work unless it's attached to everything else. And the same thing with active orientation. It's just, as I was saying before, a lot of this is about drawing lines around things and, mm, and mm. saying, this is interesting this isn't it's useful to talk about things in, the, in these ways um so the active orientation you could say is is it's 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 similar in many respects to the zone of proximal development but the zone of proximal development is largely focused on um collaborative circumstances or, or teaching circumstances okay but where you're looking at saying, well, this is the scope with which a child can attend and you'd be, and the adult might have some awareness of that. And the, aware, and the adult, you could say, has their own scope too. Where active orientation, you can just, you can see how the zone of proximal development or the ideas within that can play out within active orientation. You say, it doesn't really matter whether anyone is present or not, any additional people are present or not in your own everyday undertakings of things, there's going to be a natural scope and extent to which you, you, you have to, you undertake activities. Um, it might, depending on what other questions, preliminary questions you have, it might be useful to step into some of the distinctions that I make in this paper, some of the high level distinctions that I make that will help perhaps come to this understanding i might have to talk a little bit you know maybe yeah go talk talk for five minutes to explain 
some 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 key parts but hopefully that, that this will also help to tie things together okay but uh, you have to bear in mind that at this juncture i'm 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 going beyond what vygotsky would have written necessarily but i can relate to it mm. okay right so uh, i i have with that in mind and i think that is okay. a good a good uh procedure as we move forward i i, I want to just let a couple questions hang in the air though okay that's okay sure. and uh so my last question was like, what role does active orientation play in cognitive development or cognitive reorganization? I, I'm also curious, is, is, is active orientation something that's manipulable or influenceable or yep. okay. yep. individually developable, developable yep. I guess? And then in the background, um, what's good for teachers to know about this concept? So Right, yeah. And maybe, okay. maybe what makes you say so? So those are yeah, just yeah. a couple questions for the background. Yeah, they're and all. They're, uh, those are great questions. They're spot. They're spot. Uh, I'm in. I'm in agreement with the, the direction relevant. you're taking with those questions. Yeah, I mean. That, and and then I did reason. have one more, which was like, uh, uh, if somebody is reflecting while doing something, so they're mm -hmm. kind of maybe of two minds at the same time. What are, what are some of the good things that might happen, as a result of that? Oh, so that's another question in the background because I know there are bad things that can happen, yeah. you know, second guessing and whatnot. But what's the good side of that? Uh, okay, yeah. Okay, yeah. so I think at this point, like, if you want to, if you want to direct the ship a little bit, I think that would be fine. And perhaps maybe even going diving into section nine, maybe, which was uh, these were where you start laying out five epistemological forms. Okay, but okay. that's totally up to you. I think I think it would be best for you to lead the ship at this point. Well, it might, it may well be that this is in section nine. The material I'm looking at, I just pulled out from, from the end, but it probably, in section nine is probably where it's introduced. The other thing is um, the, four, the three or four questions that you said, just leave hanging. You might want to just bring them, reiterate them yeah. or bring them back. If these are, you know, main areas of topic, because I could answer those straight away, but I want to get these points out. But yeah, I'm, I, I'm not thinking about the questions and because for things that are familiar to you, you don't necessarily um, try to remember. You yeah, know, exactly. You know what I mean? So, and, I will, and I will remember these questions because, uh, okay. you know, one of the interesting things about this conversation is that uh, we're, we're looking to meet in the middle, but we also have our own, have our own things that we want to walk away with. Sure. So let's, let's pick up from... Whatever you think is best. I was thinking possibly the five different forms, unless you wanted to go in a different direction. No, that's that's great. So section Thanks. nine in my paper. Um, so I have a title called um, for section nine: Five Epistemological Forms Implicated in Cognitive Development. Now these sites sound quite. Um, special words to use and anyone familiar with some aspects of the history of philosophy might start getting ideas about what this is all about. When people start talking about forms and epistemology or even sort of metaphysics and things, they might start thinking about, oh, this is going down particular lines of philosophy, perhaps in agreement with Plato or, or certain variants of idealism and other things. But it, it's, I would, I would argue, say, well, it may be influenced, but it's influenced by many other things too. And it's not, it's not necessarily that, uh, what I'm driving at isn't necessarily of that nature. So I, I quickly list out some forms, what I call epistemological forms in this paper. You could call them other things, but what I list out five, I distinguish five different forms. I'm sorry for the noise on the computer, by the way. Hopefully it's not too loud. No, I can't hear it. It's okay. Okay, great. And, and, I, and I'll just say, I'm, I'm sorry if my eyes are darting back and forth a lot. It's because my printer wasn't working. That's so right. I have some of my notes on the screen. Yeah, yeah, that's all right. So um, five, five forms. I'll just read them out and then talk about them a little bit. The first form I'm referring to is references to constant objects of action 
within a given context of activity. Okay. Now, second form, references to recurring contexts of activity. Third form, reference to plans of action distinct from the activity that the plans are about. Fourth, reference to systems of criteria. And the fifth, reference to self-generative processes. Now I use these forms to describe and to categorize degrees of sophistication of thought and activity which you could generally apply to developing children but you'll find you see when I'm getting into the fifth the fifth form that's very advanced really okay and you wouldn't expect children to be going into that yeah Hugh, when I, Hugh, when I read when I read this I was like it's like okay one of the things Hugh's doing here is he's he's not just talking about kids and teenagers he's talking about adults yeah. too in the lifespan yeah, yeah. so this yeah, is yeah. a little more encompassing than yeah. some of the material that I was heretofore familiar with so that's sure. one thing I like about this okay good well yes yeah, so so you can put yourself in this mm. in this well you know if it if it's you might not even agree with it but what I've stopped you can also look at this logically and just see that there is what's going on is uh, a um, an incremental increase in the sophistication okay of what what is taking place there there are degrees of reflex reflection and reflexivity taking place so let's um, somewhere it might be later on that I, I give out lots of examples, well, I give out concrete examples of these forms, but I'm not going to start reading the paper. I'm just going to extemporize, okay? Um, so in the first, for the first category, we can look at activity of young children, okay? And their, um, reference to objects that are what we what we would loosely describe as being immediately available to them or within in my sense is so they're within the scope of one of the activity taking place before them so you might say there's a um, some kind of toy could be a ball or a, you know um, a car or what have you and they can they can either use it doesn't even they don't have to even use the words like car or ball it could just be pointing to this object and they're communicating about it whether it's communicating to themselves or to other people okay that doesn't really i'm not what i'm interested in in this these distinctions the first distinction is they have a scope of activity and the references that are applying are to things within that immediate activity. Okay, happy with that? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, 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 my notes for myself, I sort of wrote down the difference between numbers one and two is numbers one is concrete and two is begins the process of generalization. Okay. Okay. Yeah, you're all right. Okay. Yeah, so step two references to recurring contexts of activity okay so now the child becomes familiar over time with different ways of behaving okay and they can get a sense of um, play activity okay or eating or having lunch or you know um, being looked after been cared for certain activities aren't going to be very you know some are going to be more clearly defined than others mm -hmm. but here we have the op the child then starts to get the opportunity to talk about or or refer to activities that they're not actually currently doing necessarily so it's going to be saying um 
I want to go and play, okay? Or, or when is it going to, when is it lunchtime? Okay, so they're, they're already now start, they've, 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 they're able to go beyond the immediacy of the situation in some respects and talk about familiar contexts. And not only are they able to talk about familiar contexts, but they might have, for example, certain familiar objects could mean to them or, or could carry a particular sense to them of the meaning based upon the activities that they usually um, um, relate to. So uh, shown a toy and they might think about play, yes. They're shown a plate or a, or a cup or something, they might think more about the food situation. So the already objects might start to um, carry for them particular contextual senses. Okay, so, so we're starting to get it, so they're starting to get a notion of a context of activity. Okay, third form, reference to plans of action distinct from the activity that the plans are about. Okay, so now I'm talking about, um, if we're talking about children, a child being able to, to some, some degree of, of, of rigor, describe a set of, um, a set of actions or, or to themselves or to someone else about an activity that they're not currently doing. Do you see the, the relevance of that? Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So now they're able to they've they're able to think about a familiar activity. Okay, and actually talk about that without actually materialistically doing it from the outside. Yeah. So they're going to say, um, you know, so it could be about what they're going to have to eat for tea, or whatever, or it could be um, that their their brother or sister happened you know um took their toy all right or that they don't want their brother or sister taking their toy and they're going to put it in a special place mm. or what have you all these sorts of things but hopefully it should be quite it should be fairly apparent that you can't do step three here without first of all being um familiar with step two and likewise with step one. So I, I'm drawing a, there's a logical dependency between these. You, know, you uh, I think most people would probably agree with that. I'd say, you know, the, I mean, it doesn't, what I'm saying you can't do, I mean, developmentally you can't do it. It doesn't mean that someone might occasionally be able to be, you know, a, a fairly young child might mm -hmm. talk about plans occasionally and other times might, might not do so because it's on the cusp of their, their capabilities being quite young and, and today we, we and we might talk about uh how one moves between these stages like how, how one develops these each yeah. subsequent capacity yeah. if you wanted to i okay. think we do some of that in section 11 i believe but yeah i think what i wrote for number four was i called it comparative analysis and design that was how i summarized it for myself but you might talk about that very differently no, yeah, I talk about design in the paper as well. So st step three is, is quite a rich step in itself because n uh, at its earlier stages, you would probably, it would probably be uh, descriptions that the child is, is offering to a parent or, or to some other, some other children or likewise adults talking to the child and talking about doing something giving them, you know, suggesting things they can do and the child engaging in that, that, um, that process of planning. But of course the planning can extend far beyond just merely talking about it and you can actually get into much more detailed kind of plans. Okay. Um, 
so if they're you know like with my own children i think uh one of them liked to write their own little manuals for building like lego con constructs and things okay so you could say you know this is how you know they're going to say this is how to build a particular thing and you sort of em emulate the the, the manuals that you get for building things and, and and put together his own you could say well that's sort of quite a sophisticated plan okay so as you rightly were saying on on the fourth the fourth um form that i'm referring to references to systems of criteria now we have extra complication in the planning process we're saying first of all it's to build this plan it's not any old plan that would do you have a first of all you have there are certain criteria that must be met and you're formulating what those criteria are and building plans around that so there are there are many more constraints around the plan and conventionally in sort of the adult world you might say well it's sort of this where what people would talk about you know creative aspects entering into play because now you need to work out a plan of action that for example might uh, address two apparently contradictory um, um, criterions make sense mm -hmm. yeah I can think up lots of examples I suppose you probably think up some perhaps with your how old are year 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 eight children in, in America how old are they typically 13 yeah 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 so you know all sorts there's going to be you know criteria that they need to meet in you know if they're writing a, a story or an essay or something and you know it's although you want them to to uh not be too inhibited but you want to in introduce some discipline at the same time and say you know this is it has to meet certain criteria so would this the step four involve the uh identifying naming or creating of criteria or or rather um the meeting and considering of criteria that might be externally presented to you well both yeah i think okay. by the by the, by the very nature of there in terms of in terms of, because when you think about the their own individual process in order to even grasp a criterion okay they need to construct that in their own process or activity so even if it's being provided mm. they still need to to work out their own comprehension of what what that means to a certain degree so to some extent is this so, so let's say you're planning something you have intentions I'm, I'm speaking very broadly so correct me by all means mm -hmm. like say say you're at the stage where you're sort of planning something out and you're intending and then you're at the next stage where you're really more fine-grained mm -hmm. thinking it through at the criterion level mm -hmm. is is that one difference between uh like is, is that one difference between these two levels like you're really sort of getting a little more nitty-gritty at the higher level what between between step four, between the step third, fourth and, and the third um yes like it's a, well, it's like just, it's when, a, when, like when criteria resolution when criteria become explicit and they they um because you can have plans of action that can be quite very loose mm -hmm. i mean as an ad the part of the difficulty sometimes when you're looking at this from an adult's perspective is is you could take for granted so much all the complexities and difficulties and the challenges that children can go through you can easily forget you know it's like first time you see a young you know particularly with your own, your own children you might see a child young child um um having to work to work you know and finding a challenge to put together a jigsaw and you think mm -hmm. well it can remind you that there is quite a process to that so the plans for, for i was my identifying step three is plans of action distinct from activity that the plans are about is yes they can talk about something but there isn't necessarily a a, a large degree of rigor in that 
planning that pertains to all the criteria that must be met or it could be mm. what i find in the children i observe is they don't necessarily apply too much criteria it's just they have a plan and it goes in a certain direction and they just go with it you know if they you don't necessarily think oh no that's that's not tidy enough or that isn't what i intended it sort of just emerges in, in that yeah. process yeah so the step the fourth form that i i find useful to distinguish is the references of reference to systems of, our, of criteria which yes partake in, in in the planning process and there of course it can get very rich because you're getting into um uh design in the um mm. productive and commercial sense of things and that can be very very rich um uh there's so much that you could i could reference as examples to that but i think is it i might be quite self-explanatory um the fifth form references to self-generative processes now um there might be slightly better ways i could word that last one because you could say well i could describe to my my children for example who are still quite young and i just say well uh this is a process that creates itself and i might give them sort of a a, a simplified explanation of this but that's not quite what i'm meaning here i'm meaning actually get into the details of of such a process and think about it in terms of how it can reproduce itself and i would suggest that this is this kind of thinking is dependent on on having mastered the um the planning with systems of criteria that entails design mm. is what i'm what i'm referring to self-generative processes is looking at um looking at a a, a process that generally regenerates itself especially through what's often called a functional systems sort of perspective we but to look at it sort of like from snapshots across time and see how the shape or the morphology of a structure can change over time and effectively come back to where it was or see how it reproduces itself over time okay and i would say to try and get into that in a systems mentality mm -hmm. you, you it, it's dependent upon mastery of these prior steps okay and i, I put that fifth step in there as a sort of more of was a, as a form of complete completing the process i don't really go beyond that now coming back to this i i would um i could um perhaps introduce a sixth step uh, about some of the things i've been looking at but there's no need to go into that now is, one of the ways is this a is, is this fifth step at all analogous to i used to be a wrestler and there was all okay. sorts of you know practice and technique and form and, and revision etc but then there's a point where you you almost snap into like automatic mode flow mode mm -hmm. is there any reference re any any uh, analogy to step five being sort of a flow state not particularly automated I mean, state not particularly okay, I mean, i'm still not 100 percent understanding the right well, well, self-regeneration part yeah yeah it's just all our, all of these basically forms of coordination um either in activity or in thought it's by I, I don't there isn't a hard and fast distinction that i make between the two because they blend into each other um now as we've talked about this before but i can just as a reminder simple ways to think about this for example is in coordination it's sort of if you're trying to do what you might think of typically as being two separate things but you're trying to do them at, at the same time that's a kind of coordination you could have that an activity you know like just juggling or, or what have you um, you could have it in the, what you might typically think is a thinking situation so for example if you're playing a game of chess or you're teaching a child to play chess 
areas that once they have mastered basic um, rules of the game and they start thinking about this chess pieces that they can move around one of the difficulties they're going to find is thinking about coordinating the possibilities of these movements of the pieces so what i found when i was t teaching um, my children and some some others about improving their chess or learning chess is to strip away the board and reduce to reduce it down to just a few pieces mm. so you can play a little game for example of um i don't know how familiar you are with chess but you don't need to be to really follow this the, the point of it if you've got just two kings and a castle on the board or, ki or two kings and a rook and um in order to to win the game in order to 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 checkmate your opponent in that situation you can't just do it by moving one piece around you have to coordinate the king and the castle very carefully in order to pin the the opposing king on the edge of the board and and an execute checkmate in the, so you and for a child who's learning at that stage it's going to be quite frustrating or they're going to be you know it, it might be enjoyable depending on how they're looking at it but they're, they're, you can't just do it with one piece. Otherwise, their opponent were able to escape every situation. Okay. So that's a kind of mental, that's much more of a mental coordination. Okay. You're not having to do physical juggling. Okay. You don't have to stand on, standing on one leg while you're playing the game of chess is sort of could make it a bit more difficult for you, but that's not the kind of difficulty I'm talking about. There's a, there's a difficulty inherent to the structure of the game of chess that they're coming to, to master. So um, both of them are, both of those issues, both the activity in the very, in the set, when you've got juggling going on, that's a kind of coordination. And also then there's in like playing chess is a form of coordination. Largely I'm referring to the kind of chess variants and of, of, of uh, um, when I'm talking about coordination, it's just a clearer area. So when I'm talking about this fifth stage of self-generative processes, I'm largely talking about um, processes where people that engross themselves in thinking about loosely what's called morphogenesis, or you know, so it's particularly in science and other areas where people, for example, in biology, they're interested in how things grow, how things change, okay? Um, and there's, you know, it's, it's, there's lots of areas of science that, that entail looking at how things change shape in some form, how, how the function of things changes over time. Mm -hmm. it's, it's inherent in any developmental process, okay? So this applies also to, um, the research work of Vygotsky and his peers, okay? Because they're looking at developmental processes. So I'm saying at this stage, we're looking at typically a, 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 a mature adult's activity, mm. okay? At that stage. So we start with these five, five, this distinction of five forms, okay? I'm describing um, or delineating aspects that are interesting to me starting from a very early age mm. through to what we might typically think as being uh, uh, fruition in in thinking activity now just to point this out just to relate this somewhat to Vygotsky's um, uh, writing particularly in the writing of the uh, the first volume of the collected works or um, if you just got his one of the uh, translations of um, thinking and speech everything that's in there I would suggest to you that in in this text Vygotsky is writing about um, three variants of logical reasoning Okay. He's talking about very 
early stages of kind of logical re reasoning that leads up to pseudo concepts that he refers to okay so this is when the child gets as far as for example being able to match up say triangles of a particular color and, and what have you um, he distinguishes this from formal concepts okay so he might say well both a child and an older child or an adult might agree about um, what is a triangle and what isn't, but the basis for their agreement can be somewhat different, okay? So for someone who has a more sort of um, formal conceptual understanding of a triangle, it doesn't really matter if the triangle looks odd. It could be an uh, extremely uh, thin triangle, right? If your two end angles are like one degree each and your obtuse angle is 178 degrees, it's still a triangle, okay? Because it all adds up to 180 degrees. But for a child whose sort of uh, behavior is in a, in a line with what Vygotsky calls pseudo concepts, maybe they'll say, no, that's not a triangle, all right? Because it doesn't sort of fit within their prototypes of the way, the way they the image the images that they're they're working with so those are two forms of logic that um Vygotsky is talking about okay the build up he builds he talks about several stages that building up from syncretic thoughts through to pseudo concepts okay so mm. all those stages i'm just saying yeah let's just think about that in terms of that's just one form okay that he's thinking about then he's talking about the formal concepts all right but he also, in this text, is also talking about, um, oh, sorry. So the formal concepts, I think he might use the word, use the phrase true concepts when he gets through to this. And he's talking about um, typically children that get through to sort of high school stage and start doing what he's, you know, at, at this effectively, I'm paraphrasing, thinking proper or, you know, thinking more like an adult. So this I'm, I'm, referring to his formal logic now he also talks about another kind of logic but not in the not in his reference to children's activity but he talks about it in, uh, in terms of his own activity and his critiquing of others researchers okay because if you go talk about uh, look at any of his chapters where he's talking about um uh his methods mm. or critiquing uh, other people's methods it often refers to things like the unit of analysis or if they're you know they're, they're people studying things in terms of elements rather than units okay mm -hmm. and this largely comes down to a distinction between researchers that are researching in terms of formal logic and other researchers that are starting to um, go beyond that and take on a more dialectical appreciation for the process okay mm -hmm. so Vygotsky generally you could say he's talking about three different forms of reasoning mm. there's the pseudo conceptual there's the formal logic and there's sort of the dialectical and the formal logic crops up in two locations it crops up in terms of the uh, older children in, in their school learning okay but it also crops up in terms of other researchers okay and he's, but so in one sense he's lauding it and saying yes that it's very good that the children are now learning true concepts all right but then on the other hand when he's talking about um uh researchers that he's critiquing it, he's saying well they're no they're not they're not they don't they're not true concepts really because it's there's much more to it you want mm. to look at things beyond formal logic so those three forms of logic you can relate to um, aspects of my epistemological forms. Okay, the dialectical thinking you can relate to the fifth stage, self-generative processes. Mm. Okay, formal logic you can relate to um, the uh, third form, but also the fourth. All right, if you're getting into sophisticated logic, all right. Then you've got criteria that that in your logical statements once you start for example once you start actually uh, building up logical systems using formal logic or 
or, or logics that are similar to it, I'm being quite loose in what I'm referring to as formal logic, okay? Um, then that, that's, you've got all the criteria that are, that are being met there. And the pseudo conceptual, you can relate to the first form and maybe a bit of the second as well, okay? You can mm -hmm. pretty much map that on, yeah? And expect to see correlations between them. And that was a helpful way to, to help me understand the fifth stage. Good. In a way that I previously didn't. So yeah. that clarifies a lot. Good. Great. I, before, before we continue, and, mm -hmm. and we, might, we might look a little more into the, the process of how each of these worms like, develops. We might do that today. But can you just define a term for me? Mm -hmm. Personal epistemological knowledge. What does that mm -hmm. term mean? simple terms um how you understand what you know it's as simple as i one simple um okay. yeah so your basis of understanding of things um so basically a, a epistemology but on a personal about yourself yeah, or your your own your own own understandings. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think this this particular way of referring, particular use of words, is going to just suggest someone who's already quite reflexive mm. in order to to do that. Because you know, younger children, you might say, well, they don't actually think about. Their understanding but i would suggest that it's implicit in any in all learning activity because it's also applied to understanding about how do you how you learn okay and once you're once you're not once you're you might think of epistemo, epistemological knowledge as such a special a sort of special category of knowledge that instead of being knowledge about oh uh, minecraft or how to build a lego um, construct or how to bake a cake right mm. it's knowledge about how you learn things or what works for you mm. right so even like knowledge about what generalization means and how you can come to generalize okay so through the practice of learning you're already becoming starting to build up ideas about how you learn and, and what knowledge is okay and in fact i would suggest, so suggest that if having a very rich um, formulation about um, epistemology and what knowledge is, is going to help in the learning process. Okay. So you're not just going to take things for granted necessarily. It's almost like you've got um, a, an additional perspective onto anything that you come into. You're not, you're not dependent on someone else to point things out to you you say well hang on i know this is this is sort of what knowledge is all about and you're introducing a new kind of set of knowledge that i am not familiar with yet but i know that it must meet certain ideas or i'm expecting it to meet certain ideas now as a child you're not going to have a fully formed epistemology and you know or set of ideas about what knowledge is you're going to be building it up so you're gonna there's a two-way process of one informing the other mm. Now, is, this how, is this how you tend to operate personally? Um, have tended? Well, yes, but it would be, it's just, um, it's not even, it's not necessarily, necessarily even conscious. It's just, for me, it's just part of the, it's so integral. Yeah. And I think for many adults, it would be that. I think maybe if you start being more conscious about it, then you start to think, you know, you, you recognize it as a sort of a separate system and that you mm. set, set, set of ideas that you have to be quite conscious of to, to, to integrate. But um, it's like many things that you become familiar with. They just, they become second nature. Mm. I mean, in terms of, you know, reasoning, if someone, you know, it's like the, when I'm, when I'm uh, corresponding with people or, or having one of these conversations online, 
if something you know if things just stand out for me like if there's a logical if something just doesn't make sense logically i don't have to think about it you know it's just like it's like some people would see a word and say it see that it's spelt wrong and it would just stand out and they say you can see it or my wife who does a lot of editing things would just stand out saying no that's wrong and they just see it mm -hmm. straight away and similar for me if it's if there's a logical construct that's just oh, not yeah. right it's just it's just it just sticks out you know i don't really have to think about it in that sense so but yes originally i think i would be you know as a younger younger adult and you know older child i'd been you know thinking about things like what is generalization you know or just sort of thinking about learning processes and that sort of thing but i think that's a healthy thing to do and um it's just i think it's part of our societal history that sometimes that doesn't take place but i think that more of it should take place within the learning environment because it's you're gaining much more mastery and 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 personal personal freedom but also mm. a, i would suggest in the cognitive or thinking world um more creativity as well because you're not you're not so dependent on on um teachers and uh and just the subjective material that's in front of you you can think about well the material more generally integrate different ideas so is there, is there to some extent a, a like almost press you're almost pressing the pause button on your activity and then maybe like loading alongside yourself or stepping next to yourself and observing what is going on at that moment is that like a is that part of you, this skill you, you could yes you could look at it that way but then i would say that this other thing you're doing is part of your activity as well do you see so you have the your familiar activity but that's now embedded within another reflective process there's different ways you can mm. i mean some some of these ways of talking about it are, are a little bit abstract because it, it's sort of it's like a sketch it simplifies things to make it stand out but at the same time it's mm. it loses its uh the once you start categorizing things and the suggestion is that they are fully separate different yeah items. i understand yeah but that in itself is saying that that's sort of more of an, an attribute of formal logic way of thinking which is what you'd ex typically most adults i would say especially in their professional capacity it's all formal logic typically okay so there's, I'm not say, I'm not I'm not I'm not trying to say that one is better than the other or, or what have you. It's mm -hmm. just the way the way things. The way yeah. Things well, I'm I'm asking you. I mean, I noticed that at least it seems to be that you have a particular talent for that. To so, if you were to sort of step alongside yourself, maybe you have to think back as you were developing these skills. So I might have mm -hmm. to ask you to use your imagination. Mm -hmm. One of the questions you might ask yourself is like. Uh, what is generalization or what is mm -hmm. generalizable here? Mm -hmm. And can you imagine maybe like a handful of other questions that might be good questions mm -hmm. to ask as a matter of course, if somebody wanted to sort of develop this practice of maybe I'm calling it like second layer thinking or something. Yeah, well, I think anything of a philosophical nature, really, because all of philosophy is about uh basically it's about asking questions really at the bottom at, at the end of the day but other questions i was interested as a young adult that i was interested in and uh, you know i'm talking about questions you can carry around for you for years not mm. not necessarily okay it's more the the process that you go through rather than the uh, where you end up that is i'd say perhaps more the important part um sorts of things i was inter i was i was interested in for example what is intuition yeah that was an important one for me um i was always i was was trying to i had some skills i suppose some success in my thinking processes of actually resolving certain kinds of problems as a child some some of them not I mean, if you've got family issues, you know, that are going on, you can't necessarily, not necessarily going to solve them in the same way as you can solve a simultaneous equation or something, right? Mm. You just, it's different kind of, different kind of situation. But I, I did find that there were, I did have some success 
and so when you get successful at doing certain things you might you know look, reuse that or find find ways to employ it mm. and certainly in all the areas where there's a lot of mental activity so for example ostensibly what school most of school is about you know 90 percent of it in terms of the the focus other than some physical education and some music and things most of it is sort of book or was book based and you know there's a lot of literature and other things in it so ostensibly is quite um, mental faculties focused upon that for me was saying well if i had sort of if i if i if i was encountering um issues with that then that would be good fuel for thinking about you know when i was when i was a student i was this quite average student you know i'd mostly get b's and c's and things not really you know i was never particularly um interested in 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 getting grades for grade's sake and it was a more uh, i would sort of often look at things and say yeah but i was happy to go along with situations but at the same time i could see that there's probably better ways to do things so i was always thinking about that at the same time mm. or but also i'd say um i had my own projects at an early age too and so i had a sense of when you're studying something and it's you're really studying it and you're really learning from it now i probably couldn't have formulated all this very you know in a in a, in a systemic way at the time but i certainly knew that there are some ways about going about learning that were highly productive and rewarding and 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 um lots of fun mm. and, and that you everything stuck you remember you could remember little details of that even months and months after doing so without any effort okay and yet here was this other form of learning where you have to go into school and you have to sit at the chair and you're not allowed to get down from your chair or stool until the t unless the teacher says so and you have to go through and learn all the names of uh, some the anatomy of some 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 um you know some some animal or something and uh they struck me as just being very very different and and having different um consequences and so you just learn to to you know i'm sort of many children you just learn about you know there's some things you just have to play along you know uh, and other things you can just um get more more say in what you're doing but i found you know i mean i was doing a lot of programming so when i was about i think when microcomputers first came were first sort of available we couldn't afford anything like that at home but i was fortunate enough to have a a, a teacher who's now a very good he's, he's a very good friend of mine as well and I've just sort of, but he's he, he was my teacher when i was at um what i call middle school well actually it was in primary school because i know what a brother and he went to middle school uh, uh when he was at the middle school he was like two or three years older than, two and a half years older than me and he was sort of introduced to these microcomputers and i would tag along with him because i we would go home together and so i got introduced to these 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 little uh he had a uh, teacher had like a spectrum computer so it's like a little little computer you know connect up to a, a black and white television and um uh, then i was away you know starting to write program and, and and things so that for me was a large part of my um learning from i guess it must be oh um about nine years old perhaps through mm -hmm. to you know all the way through I was still doing stuff like that in a, in a high school and what have you. Now, I would suggest it doesn't really matter about it is programming. It could have been anything. It was just that that got my attention and my interest. But it also was a system in which I could actually get involved in. And I wasn't dependent upon, I was dependent on the apparatus being there, but I wasn't dependent upon someone else to tell me how to do it mm -hmm. necessarily. I could get tips and other things. You know, I would take the manual home. It was a programming manual, and I would just take that home, and and I'd read that like as if it was a, as if it was a, a, a riveting, <laughs> you know, fiction piece of fiction about a you know hero going off an adventure. And I was like saying, you know, okay, you know, 
this this page is all about val the keyword val and next one's gonna be at len and something and he's just building up this what, one of contributing the towards contributing yeah. you know i wouldn't say i i wouldn't even think of myself as being a sort of mathematically oriented person or anything else it's just it all i could it it's a, it it was fuel for 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 the imagination to actually make things in software that that could all fit together and i could think about right is in addition to that you know you think about um like children my children would think about uh um plans for or, or scenarios in which things might happen you could do the same thing with the addition that you can actually go and build it and try it out and, and get it to work which is quite in, in, exciting so but the, it, well i have to, I have to when, say one of the uh, one of the thoughts i had while reading yeah this particular piece was uh i said this is this is what it reads like when a programmer <laughs> is writing right. about this topic okay. and right. filling in and filling in some of the gaps that were that at least in my mind are somewhat ambiguous in okay. Vygotsky's in my understanding of Vygotsky yeah yeah sure yeah, yeah. but even in programming I mean people approach it very very differently and I would say you know I, it was one of the bones of contention I would have in professional programming was that you're always trying to do a good job but I was always hampered in trying to in doing a good job because I could see that the way things were done could be done in a better way. And I suppose that's a, you know, that's a carryover from, from other, whenever you're thinking about what you're doing while you're doing it, you've always got this, this eye for, for, for design and elegance and aesthetics and other things. So. And precision. So, yeah. I think. I yeah. Think yeah. Well, the precision is, is, a, is a big feature of this piece. Well, it's now, important. I'm going to ask you, you know, to hold on just yeah. one second. Okay. Sure. Um, yeah. I have to just take care of my dog real quick. Mm, oh, okay. Okay. Thanks you. Um, yeah, so I think broadly we were talking about like, this idea of reflection and maybe developing a reflective sense. Yes, so my examples where I'm talking about my own personal examples and my involvement in other projects during my school years helped me to get a sense that there were other ways to learn mm. that other than what was the sort of the formal sense of teaching that you have in those years, but there's certain degrees of engagement that took me way beyond what was typically taught in school. And so that helped to formulate in my mind, a tacit sense of an epistemology or, or, or knowledge about my own way of learning and understanding um, that hopefully answers your question, part of your question. Um, Now, I think you want me to address this section 11, which is on the writing about the process of formation of epistemological forms. Yeah, I was thinking that because it, as I understood it when I read, that was kind of a little more fine grain okay. discussion of section nine, which was really the, the five epistemological forms. Yep. And this was kind of more of a finer grain look at how those forms develop. Yep. Okay. So I, I thought that would be worth the time. Mm -hmm. um, the first thing I write about in here is about, um, there's an interesting point that I make that it comes up in some of my other writings where I'm talking about the phrase that people use with respect to mental tools. And this is an issue that, fit, that falls within this section, early section. Um, but I need to just rewind slightly and integrate what I'm talking about, the epistemological forms. So just take me half a minute, I think, to, to refer to mm -hmm. that. Um, it's not always taken into account, or oftentimes it's often overlooked, in the sociological uh, papers when people are writing or referring to Vygotsky. And typically, I it might not be, this is, I don't have a, a sense of what people are writing right now, but I, I would think that it's, it's the, to a large extent, uh, reusing what, what has come from people like uh, Lave and uh, well, lots of others I've referred to in, in, 
in my comparisons paper. Um, when people were talking about internalization and cultural assimilation, okay, sometimes when you're reading this, you might get the sense that somehow there's material that's coming in from coming in from a, a, a child or an adult's world that they can soak up through cultural participation in what they're doing, okay? And that becomes internalized, right? Which sort of loosely fits with um, what Vygotsky is writing about. But you have to take into account, I think, the kind of, the nature of the, of the, structure of the thinking and organization and understanding of the child or agent themselves and so this is where the epistemological forms can start to help as sort of list a category because even if you just think in terms of these five forms and you think well there's different degrees of richness you come across some material whatever it is you can quickly see that depending on on how you approach it with these degrees of sophistication you're going to come away with a very different understanding. Hmm. Yeah. And it should be quite clear. So it's not just, it's not just culture coming in and imposing and you just, whatever it is, you get it, you get the uh, exact copy of whatever mm -hmm. someone else's understanding is. Right. If you've got someone's basically loosely speaking, if you've got someone's, if you've got an adult who's thinking in terms of design criteria, all right. And how they think about things and they're talking to a child who's thinking in terms of you know being able to describe plans mm. they're obviously going to come away with very different you know they might they might be able to talk about the same thing use certain vocabulary but their understanding is going to be very different okay so when we talk about this process of internalization or cultural assimilation it's it's not sufficient just to think about that it's a one-way process of coming through but this process is going to be influenced by your anticipation of the structure or how you read it. Do you see? So there's, mm -hmm. there's, there's at least an additional set of ideas that need to be included. Take this into account. Where it's possible, though, that in many situations we can talk about cultural norms in which a certain kind of epistemological form is to be expected, right? So if I go to the news agents or the local supermarket, I'm not going to be talking about self-generative ideas and the nature and, and the relation between these these objects necessarily. There's there's uh, you might say there's cultural expectations that the vocabulary and the language you use is just going to be around in a quite quite cut and dried, simple ways of talking about things. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. I'm not going to be talking about oh. Um, you know the, the the how the cardboard was manufactured for for the particular cereal packets and how that relates to other packaging and the, the you know the the ecology well, we might do right which is fair enough but but probably it won't be that and if we do get into that then it might be oh you you understand that the shopkeeper or something or whoever the, is working there enjoys that conversation you're not mm -hmm. just going to launch into it just because just, you know, unless you, know, you say, hey, I want to talk about weirdo. this. Yeah. <laughs> right. yeah. So it's interesting. I want to talk about it. So, um, so um, when, when people, if, you, if you're talking about cultural assimilation without thinking about these epistemological forms, then maybe it's one of these situations where it is implicit in the situation that you expect it just to be about a particular particular variety not too complex okay but other than that you're going to have to think about the well these these different degrees of sophistication are always going to apply they're not going to go away now that's an area that hopefully my paper makes it clear about but clearer perhaps than Vygotsky is talking about because otherwise people wouldn't get this 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 interpretation that it's all about cultural assimilation and that mm. there isn't another you know, it's like the culture's coming this way, the, the, the values and cultural values and you know, external signs for things coming one way. But mm -hmm. the other way, you've got the understandings of the child, the, the adult, and all, this, all the sophistication 
the degree to which it all is going to hang together, how it's going to coordinate, which you can't do that. You, you can't think about developmental processes without considering both. So hopefully that's one facet that what I'm writing about that can make it, make it more concrete. Now you could come back and say, well, Vygotsky didn't write about it and I'm only interested in what Vygotsky says, etc." but I think it'd still be helpful. Okay. Right. The section 11 starts with reference to something that I talk, talk about saying the um, trouble with talking about mental tools. And I'm just, this is my by way of introducing talking about, formation of epistemological forms um, I'll just read this this paragraph and mm -hmm. in considering the exemplification of these epistemological epistemological forms care should be taken to distinguish imitative demonstrations from genuine mediatory forms of construal the problematic treatment of these forms of construal as tools to be provided obscures the necessity for the agent to personally construe or construct the basis for operating in this mode. All right, so it's a little bit of a caveat. Okay, it's just saying you beware that um, when we're talking about these forms that we want to really authentically um, reference the structure, the richness of what's going on. Um, the problem with the mental tools aspect uh, I have referred to referred to in other papers. It's um, I have to think a little bit. Um, it's another problem with Vygotsky and researchers, or at least the ones that I, I came across where they would interpret the situation because they might be ignoring the epistemological factors, come to the idea that you can introduce certain, certain either material tools or even schemata or schemas to guide, to help guide someone's activity, okay? and directly relate that to a developmental process. Now I'd say you st that's missing the epistemological facets that I've been talking about to do so. Although it, you could be correct in saying that can assist and help someone. So you can give a schemata and say, you know, whether it's a recipe for, for baking a cake or, 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 um, or a set of steps or even just a sheet of paper that's got a table on it that's going to help you organize your ideas. Those kind of schemata, if you can refer to them as a mental tool, they could certainly be helpful, but they're not going to necessarily address the developmental aspect of what's going on. And this is partly addressing one of your, your floating questions, okay? In that what I'm saying is that the child or the adult in the ideal situation the child or adult needs to create that mental tool for themselves or construct that tool for themselves in order to fully understand the circumstances of it otherwise they'll only really understand that if the, they're given a schemata by someone they'll only be able to use it if they already understand the premise for that schemata I, their epistemological understanding already matches up with, with that schemata, okay? Um, in order to actually help further and enrich the epistemological understandings of the child, the nature of their knowledge, okay? Demar they need to put themselves under certain kinds of demands and difficulties in order to integrate and coordinate ideas that they currently aren't coordinated for them okay and they need it's, an, it's a form of exercise you know that they need to undergo and this is one aspect that is often overlooked when people are referring to mental tools okay because mm. they want to say oh um keep things simple and neat but by doing so they've occluded this epistemological factor okay okay um 
I then go into an example that's well, well documented, referencing uh, a book that uh, Timothy Koshman edited. And um, this refers to a teaching example where a teacher is trying to uh, help children um, learn about measuring plants. I think they're growing, they're growing some kind of plants. It might be sunflowers or tomatoes or something like this. And they're growing them in the classroom or in, in school. And they're, they're, they're taking measurements of them and they're trying to, uh, to, to, to build on that and, and sort of formalize it mentally and, and think about, think about this in um, a progressive form, like drawing graphs. But uh, from the teacher's point of view, these children haven't done graphs or anything before, and he's trying to, he or she is trying to get them to think about this subject. And uh, it's suggested either he is thinking about it in these terms or someone else might have come up to him and said, well, can you introduce mental tools into this? Or he's, he or she is thinking, can I introduce mental tools? And the idea is that, all, that what, they, what the teacher can do is provide the children with some graph paper and then somehow it become immediately apparent what they're supposed to do with this graph paper. Okay. It's quite an inch that, and this is quite an interesting um, book to get hold of. You want to go to the library and look at it because there's lots of researchers all um, looking at this from different perspectives. So I think there might be about, there might be as many as six different, different um, accounts of what's going on. I'm not sure. I'm not sure mm. there's that many, but it's still interesting to look at. Um, now, needs to say, it was. I don't think that what the teacher did was very effective at the time. Okay, and I go. It this goes back to you know my critique of what how people are referring to often referring to mental tools in that mm. they're, they're they're ignoring this <clears throat> developmental facet of the of epistemology and the ne necessity for the child to actually create the tool for themselves. I want, to, I want to read one way. sentence from this yeah. section okay. you wrote. Yeah. It is not possible to achieve more generalized forms of cognitive knowing without protracted problem-solving activity. Yeah. I'll read one more. This is because higher forms of knowing entail a sophisticated coordination of perspectives which embody the resolution of prior contradictions. Yeah. You want to Absolutely. riff on that a little bit? Okay. Um, I was thinking uh recently there's a nice um a nice metaphor that um michael cole used in a paper that i think he wrote with some colleagues a long long time ago but it was a i think it's a popular paper and lots of people why well, I, I enjoyed reading it and at the time i think he was he and some other researchers were working uh closely with uh in a sort of after school club with children and but still helping them in their learning process but the ch children were attending in a voluntary capacity and um one of the children he sort of one of the identified as as having some linguistic confusions or was just not um not responding in the typical kind of way and he was sort of discerning that there might be some something that could be a, 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 something that could be addressed there and they could work upon in the in their time together and um, he likened this situation to uh, the putting putting back together of like a, a broken vase or a, a, you've got a piece of pottery and you're putting all the shards back together okay mm. and the, the metaphor I, I don't mean to suggest that this child was in any way broken it was just that he's putting you're putting pieces together was the focus so but he's saying if you've got a vase and you're putting the pieces together you're saying well it was like his experience of it in his own mind what does michael Cole, i think referring to it, he's saying it was like you're bringing the pieces to get trying to bring help bring the pieces together but for the child they all sort of just just floated away again mm. right? there's nothing mm. to hold nothing to hold the pieces together to make mm -hmm. it whole now, in the work that I'm doing, I think I make quite a strong case for the necessity of the situation itself to be used as a means for holding the pieces together. The more 
the more um, motivated, engaged, and situated you are in some situation, okay, then the more, um, to use another metaphor, I'm a long metaphor, the more, the more impressed or molding is going to take shape with respect to the things you're trying to bring together in that situation. So you've, any problem is going to be quite situation bound. And it's a problem mm -hmm. because it's something you don't, well, sometimes things are quite a technical problem in that you already have the faculties to address it. Okay. It's just a matter of keep working at it. And then eventually you, you know, you, there might be a quite a, uh, what you might call a technical learning issue, but nothing of any uh, sense of reorganizing your knowledge or mm. understandings of things. But when you've got, when you're posed with a challenge that, that basically challenges your, your understanding of the sophistication of a problem, which is what I'm talking about in terms of these five, five different forms. Um, you need something that's going to help you bring these different coordinating patterns together. Okay. And it's only going to be something that is a, first of all, um, robust and precise enough to bring these coordinating points together. Cause you can't, it's not just like you can take two things and just merge them regardless. Okay. They have to come together in a particular kind of way. All right. It's like putting two jigsaw pieces together. Okay. So you need a sit. So your, your problem situation is very much a, a um, strong contributor to the process by which you can coordinate these forms. It's doing a lot of the holding for you. Mm. What's taking place. All right. And because you have your own, your own motivations or an impelling force, it, it, there is a, a convergent process that's going to take place. It doesn't matter. It's like you have, you know, as children and adults, you know, can often find themselves sort of arg arguing or remonstrating with a situation because it's not doing what they want it to do. Right. You know, or people like banging at the keyboard because it's like, uh, why isn't mm. this doing what I want to do? Or, or, you know, you're fixing a bicycle and it's taking five times longer than you want it to. And, you know, it's quite, that itself is quite an interesting process. You know, it's like, um, oh, what's the, the uh, term gumption traps and things, you know, where people mm. can just lose steam over situations. You know, it's all natural. You know, it happens to all, everyone. But without, because if these situations were of a strange kind of form where, where they just, if you just um, shouted at them, right? Like as if they were people and all of a sudden, you know, you'd get a different result. They might just, you know, you might, someone might actually do what you want or they might just turn around and shout back at you or whatever. Right? But the situation is, isn't that way. The situation has its own truth, right? If you're dealing with, you know, unless you're dealing with people, you know, when there's, it's more subtle, but many problem situations of the sense of working with objects of various different kinds. Um, if they're not, if they're not working together, like in the sense that Davidov was talking about in the measurements, um, you have to find out how and why they don't work. So you have to refine your own understandings. And so that's a, the situation itself can be a very good teacher in that sense, because it's presenting a kind of truth and a certain objectivity that um, you can test and it either works or it doesn't work. Okay. If, so, you, if you were to, uh, if you were to advise or, or maybe just give a teacher or a mentor of some type, something to think about that would increase the chances of the pieces coming together mm -hmm. and not really breaking back apart. Mm -hmm. Is there any short bit of advice or, or, consideration that you could offer it's just the, the points that i make right in my introduction to this set of um papers is about bringing active orientation into into education i think but it's not a lot part of this is outside of the teacher's hands presently i think because mm -hmm. because it it needs to be taken considered at the level of curriculum or even what schooling is about okay 
because uh, I think you'll find that if, you know, with a critical eye, look at it and you think actually there are, by setting a certain curriculum in, in schools, you are um, already constraining what can and can't be done in situations. So yeah, basically it's, it's, it's the active orientation and allowing for it, given that you, know, you want to maximize engagement in the process. Um, maximizing engagement is, uh, is obviously yeah. a, a perpetual topic of interest. For, yeah, for well, it's a, it's a problem because you have, you have criteria that you need to meet, right, mm -hmm. about, you know, children getting certain results, you know, meeting certain grades and all the yeah. rest of it. But that doesn't, that's not necessarily the same thing as understanding. And I have to, yeah, yeah. And, and I have to go in a couple minutes, but is, is there, um, uh, and I know, I'm, I know I'm asking you to be repetitive and I'm kind of doing that on purpose. Is there a thing that people could keep in mind if their objective was to maximize engagement in a way that is developmentally likely to be rich? Um, again, same answer. It's, it's all of what I'm writing about in here. <laughs> so I think we, we should do a part two and maybe even a part three. I don't know, but um, yeah, I need to, you need to get on with your teaching day. So, yeah, but hopefully interesting. Um, I know I'm repeating myself a little bit, but um, perhaps that's necessary. Perhaps that's a good yeah, thing. I think so. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. So we'll uh, pick it up from here. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So uh, let, let me uh, ask you a, qu a quick final question. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so this is sort of an original contribution or an, an original theory of yours, a, a, or at least maybe a missing piece. And how does one go about, how does one go about uh, getting others to notice, <laughs> recognize, oh, that's, that's or, or, uh, or see the reasons to care? And somebody's bringing something new to the table and how's that going for you <laughs> you have one minute <laughs> um it was frustrating for a while and i just kept at it um to a certain degree part of this is that i i i, I only had half in the formal capacity because originally i was doing a phd and there were difficulties i i, I hit doing that within the formal setting and i just decided i was going to nail this and do it on my own and even having completed it, it's still, because now it's sort of slightly extra mural outside the system and things and isn't formally recognized in some capacity. Mm. For certain people who are concerned about that, fine. But other people are more interested in the ideas and actually seeing whether it stands on its own. Then for them, it would be, be more rewarding, I think, to look at. But in the process, I mean, uh, these, uh, I did find it frustrating. I was thinking about these things. But actually, I, I've come across even more powerful understandings that just put this sort of in the shade somewhat. And um, it, um, it helps me uh, put things into context and I don't, I'm not fussed about it really. You know, I'm just doing what I think is best, trying to make the world a better place through this, you know, this particular angle that I'm, I'm taking. And, um, hopefully it will get taken up but um i just do do my best about that and to a certain degree part of it you might say it's my own temperament that i'm i don't play ball with the way that institutions want to go to a certain degree but also i would say if i did do exactly what the formal in the formal process that's described particularly in the sociological processes of, of, of universities there's no way i could produce this right and I can get into that because the very methods that, that social scientists use within the West, particularly, mm. uh, prevent them from producing stuff like this. Okay, so that's uh, that's, that's potentially a, a, a marketing angle. <laughs> Part of what I asked was yeah. a marketing question. Oh, I see. I mean, there's lots because the other things like when I was, I need you know you, sometimes it's just the ideas of things you need to get you going. And mm. what I when I was producing this. I enjoy large synthesis uh, to synthesize large, you know, ideas and bring them together. And this was trying to find the pivotal point. And this was what 
what it turns out to be. But yeah, I mean, I produced a pretty good software application as well that I could, you know, I could commercialize and other things, but I was yeah. going to do that too. But this other stuff just came along and it's just, yeah. it became well, what, you know, one of, so, one of my motives here is that I think there's, I think there's a real interesting contribution or slash addition or maybe reorientation that, that you're talking about that is very useful for classroom settings. Yep. And, uh, oh, no, and, I, and, I, and I'm, I'm trying to, with your help, like try to articulate that in a way that is understandable for definitely, for definitely for classroom situations. I would say it's actually the potential context is even wider in the sense that getting into self-awareness of active orientation and these things and actually the creative engagement has uh is a is a great contribution or or, or is a is, is a way towards certain forms of um human development that um is particularly useful within our kind of culture so i even getting it so i can see a continuity for example between having gone through some of this process myself of between from active orientation and going into the things that for example um uh, zen and buddhism and all sorts of other practices that talk about uh, uh talk about too um there's a i see a continuity in that but um I don't normally, I don't, it's not really, it doesn't need to be a point of focus because there's a great deal of reward just in the very, in, in, in reorganizing schooling via something like this. Yeah. And I'm not saying, you know, this isn't, you don't need to look at this as original it, or you could just say it's a, it's a, it's an original expression of and articulation to a sufficiently, de sufficiently sophisticated degree of precision that can argue the point for it and, and, and bring this through and, and change the way institutions are run to allow for this because they don't have to be, they, you can accommodate it and still have timetables and still have classrooms. Yeah, I don't mean, you know, there's, there are lots of things that are necessary. So, yeah, absolutely. I lost your volume there a bit, sorry. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, look forward to it. Okay. Yeah. All right, have a, have a good day. Yeah, okay. Bye-bye.